Despite the initial hype around Otona Precure, now that it's over, opinions are a bit mixed. I was pretty excited about the show being a fan of Yes5, but now that I've caught up, I'm left feeling disappointed. The adult premise implied a level of depth and gravity that the story failed to deliver on. Additionally, the show's themes and character writing left me feeling confused and talked down to. There's a lot to discuss, so let's examine what went wrong with Otona Precure. Otona Precure is a spin-off of the main series, following the cast of Yes5 and Splashstar as adults. The show would follow them facing adult challenges around love, life, and pollution. Given the target demographic of Precure, I wasn't expecting much since the show could still be found by younger fans. I personally expected a fun slice of life, showing the troubles of adulthood, but what did the show want to tell us? I'm not here to criticize what it should have been, I'm here to engage with what the show actually is. Putting aside my expectations, let's examine what Otona Precure set out to do and what the story is all about. Despite the premise I just gave, the story is actually a lot deeper, for better and for worse. It's a story about selfishness, examined through the climate crisis. This is a pretty bold premise for your average show, let alone a Precure spin-off. With the power of hope, let's see how this goes. From minute one, Otona Precure is an incredibly beautiful show. I couldn't help but appreciate the shading in all the hair and the really glossy backgrounds. It's a very pretty show to watch. The first scene sets up the theme of time and the future before cutting to Nozomi preparing for work. This episode is a reintroduction to Nozomi, who is now working as a teacher. She teaches her class about the climate crisis setting up that theme early. It's good to establish both time and climate change early on, so I'm glad they got it out of the way. Nozomi's challenge of the week is helping out one of her students, Rumi. She's a passionate dancer who will have to transfer school soon. Due to her father's business failing, the family will leave town, placing Rumi in a school without a dance club. This means that she'll have to leave her dream behind. It's a pretty grounded problem that puts Nozomi's ideals to the test. Unlike her childhood, there's no real villain here. This is reflected in Rin's problems, who's struggling to come up with a good design at her jewelry job. It's good to see the two facing adult problems without obvious solutions. While it's easy to give in to despair, the series delivers one of its best lessons through Rumi. As Nozomi breaks down, Rumi brings out the series theme. If there is no dance club, then she will simply make one. Rumi's statement embodies the power of hope. This is what Nozomi and the show aim to teach us. No matter how hard things get, if you have hope, then you have the strength to pursue your dreams. This is the moment that really sold me on the show. A pretty resonant theme for old fans facing new challenges. But that's not the full story. In the background of this genuinely touching episode, the main villain was whining about time while evil civilians did pollution. Yes, the evil monsters are made by humans doing pollution. At least sometimes, we'll get to that. It's at this point that we have to address the real plot of this show. Before we begin, let's acknowledge that the climate crisis is real. Climate change is a genuine issue, and I'm glad that it got highlighted. But this show's portrayal of pollution is just laughable. Throughout the show, I kept laughing at how hopelessly evil the world is. Smirking civilians tossing trash, evil influencers ordering food just to throw it away, businessmen cutting down trees to build. It's embarrassingly shallow, and paints pollution as a product of evil individuals making bad choices. At the beginning, I mentioned the show's focus on selfishness, and I believe that pollution was a relevant topic or lens that they could examine this issue with. Within the show, climate change is less about the systems that govern the world, and more so a vehicle for the show's naive but passable message. 
This is why I said I wanted to engage with what the show is because I don't think it really set out to treat this topic very seriously. In real life, most pollution is caused by large corporations and capitalism. I was not expecting the show to tackle this, nor did the show want to. Within Otona Prikyor, pollution is a consequence of bad individual decisions. While this angle could have worked, it needed a tighter focus. If the point was to show how humans are selfish and don't care about others, maybe the world should reflect that. This is what I think the show was attempting to do within our characters' personal lives. When it comes to adult life, there's a lot you could talk about. Life gets really specific as everyone goes their own way. So let's follow each character through their respective arcs. My personal favorite was Udara's struggle as an actress. She's working on a stage play under a harsh director, but during rehearsals, Udara's struggling to bring her character to life. It's a realistic struggle that I relate to as an artist. As Udara's struggles worsen, she's forced to take some time off. And during her break, we start to see the root of this problem. Udara's struggle on stage are a symptom of a greater problem. Due to her focus on acting, she's long since abandoned her singing. There's a clear gap between Udara the actress and Udara the singer. However, Syrup is able to reconcile these two halves. Udara is both a singer and an actress, but she's also a lot more than that. She's Cure Lemonade. Udara forgot to bring herself to the stage. This is reflected in director Mariko's feedback that Udara's angel is just a copy. It's only by taking a break and living her normal life that she can share that life with her character. It's a subtle commentary on art showing that the best inspiration often comes from real life. Through her song, Udara reconnects with her full self and this life is shared with her character. It's also a nice touch that not everyone likes it. Udara's life is not a democracy and it's made up of things that some people like and others don't. This wholeness is what's required to make good art. Director Mariko could easily have rejected her ideas, but Urara suggested them anyway. As one of the best arcs in the show, I just had to bring it up first. The next character I loved was Karen. I've loved Karen since her debut, since she's a pretty assertive character and I tend to love those. As an adult, she's notably softer, which is fitting for her arc in the story. As a child, Karen seemed like a firm pillar of strength for her team. As an adult though, she still offers support but has clearly softened up. In her arc, she helps a disabled runner slowly start her recovery. While child Karen might have been harsh and stubborn, adult Karen is patient and offers support to people in times of need. Karen's new strength is her persistent kindness. She stays curious about the girl's resistance and through this, she's able to dig through the girl's trauma. I really admire that her new strength comes in the form of kindness. It's a valuable skill that shows how far she's come. Even with Milk, we see this kindness as she puts her to bed. Adult Karen is all about care. She isn't afraid to get hurt, inconvenienced, or put herself in others' shoes. Through this approach, Karen gets through to her patient and encourages her to take the next step. In many ways, she embodies the series theme best, a selfless woman who works hard to understand others. Her story arc is some of the show's best writing. As I'm sure you can tell, we are ignoring the shadow sections because I don't think they add much to any of the character arcs, and we'll get to it once we get to it. The next two we'll cover are Saki and Mai. I haven't watched Splash Star yet, but I do like the conflicts presented for them. For Saki, she's a baker at Panpakapan Bakery, which is her family business. However, recently, she's been interested in studying baking in France. She's worried about upsetting her parents by leaving, but she eventually opens up and is met with acceptance. It felt very grounded to have her worry about selfishly leaving her family for her own dreams. Also, it's a good message about growing up and presents a really healthy and supportive family. Mai is in the orbit of all this and while at first I didn't get her arc, I really like it now. She's mostly concerned with following her own path. As a woman of her age, marriage and children are regular events in her friends' lives. However, Mai feels a simple fulfillment from her job. It's a touching message about charting your own path of womanhood. It might seem like a minor plot point at first, but 
I hope I've shown you that it's still a worthwhile arc. Now, the remaining two cures are less focused. Rin's plotline has some good bits, but its messaging is quite excessive. Her episode dealt with the weight of balancing multiple duties as an adult. Rin is currently a jewelry designer and has been in a creative rut for a while. While running late for an office competition, she chooses to ignore a shadow and prioritizes her job. It's a very selfish choice, but given the circumstances, it makes sense. They're not kids anymore. The stakes are much higher, and adult life often demands a greater level of balancing and commitment to one's roles. Despite Rin's childhood offering her the freedom to do it all, her adult life won't be so kind. This was the good part. As expected, the worst part was the commentary. I think the jewelry plotline brought up some concerns about the mining industry, and I just don't know that this is the show to bring that up. Considering what they ignore about the climate crisis, it's very bizarre that they thought this was what should get focus. I think the show has a lot on its plate already, so throwing on labor regulations just felt a little excessive. Finally, I found myself quite disappointed with Komachi's role. She was in the background gardening and playing babysitter, while everyone else has a career. She felt like she was stuck in the boring half of a filler episode. Early on, there were hints of insecurity, but it got resolved pretty fast. Exploring a character who's already achieved her dream can be pretty interesting, but here they dropped the ball. She's involved in invigorating the town, but it never felt as important as the other Cure's roles. Cure Black and White get to go to Antarctica and travel, but Komachi's stuck playing babysitter. While everyone else is tackling the balance of adult life and having their selflessness challenged, Komachi is sitting in the garden. Her biggest contribution was providing research on the shadows. I think it suits her interests and gives her a passive but believable role in the story. I also appreciate the subtle generational theme, with her inspiring a few of the children in her neighborhood. It's a passable arc, but it's definitely tame. She's got the least going on and feels out of orbit for most of the show. I'm happy she was here, but she deserved a better show. As we wrap up on the character section, we have to acknowledge Coco. I'm not getting into the mess behind that relationship, but rather what he does for the show. While he's not as major early on, he's also facing challenges with his kingdom's water supply, and due to a drought, he's forced to share the kingdom's water with the neighbors. I'm struggling to remember this because it showed up for like one episode. It's also implied that the kingdom's problems have kept him away from Nozomi, but he's not that detrimental to the plot outside the usual concerns we had in ES5. I think they tried to give him an arc about selfishness and it, it was passable, but I don't really think he matters, so let's wrap it up. I'd also like to acknowledge Kurumi, who faces the real-life challenge of Japanese work culture. While I found her decision to be Prime Minister quite entertaining, I struggle to place her in this video's narrative, so while I enjoyed her inclusion, I just don't think it's in line with the show's message or what we're here to analyze. Throughout the show, the most jarring sections are definitely the shadow scenes. Right in the middle of a beautiful story, I'm reminded that we're actually here to talk about evil humans doing pollution. The shadows come from human bodies and are rendered in awkward CGI. They move pretty slowly and are generally a minor menace. It is a bit comical to see people collapse just to see CG blobs appear, but thematically they fail to add any value to the show. Previous monsters were used to bluntly hammer in the theme. Think back to the Nakewa Meke that erased all mothers. In an episode about appreciating your parents, nothing rubs it in more than the magical monster that gets rid of her. If your dream is to be a model, then maybe a big monster will get in the way, forcing you to pick between your personal dreams and your precure responsibility. The shadows don't really do that. They don't hammer in any messages, and in most episodes, they just get in the way of a pretty good storyline. I was watching a tender slice of life when suddenly, I see this on screen. To fully embody the shadow's failures, we have to discuss the central conflict. Nozomi and Belle are wrapped up in the central conflict and best embody the series' theme. 
Through Bell, we're able to see the through line between pollution, selfishness, and time. Bell is a fairy that we see throughout the show who's always muttering about time. She's the main antagonist and turns people into shadows. At first, I thought it was a punishment for pollution, but especially early on, the victims seem pretty random. While Belle says they're the shadows of humans' weak and selfish hearts, I have to wonder what these people did. The counter to Belle is meant to be Nozomi, and by extension, the other cures. Now, Nozomi goes through a lot this series, working to become not just a teacher, but a person the town can rely on. This is the hopeful counter to Belle's pessimism. The two meet in episode 5 to discuss their ideals, and here Belle reveals her beliefs plainly. I really liked this encounter as it felt quite personal. I wouldn't mind if all the shadows were dark reflections, but it seems that's a privilege reserved for main characters. It's, a, it's also impressively shallow that Nozomi's shadows are about Coco. I know it's because he was just brought up, but I think she has bigger problems at the moment. It's just a very jarring scene in the grand scheme of things. Despite this, I think Nozomi's selfishness still shows up in other ways. Compared to the other girls, she transforms the most times, showing her commitment to save the city. This actually takes a toll on her, proving that she's willing to risk her own life. I really like this angle, and it's supported by the other characters in smaller ways. The choice to leave your family, to prioritize your job, even the choice to keep trying for another's sake. Each of the girls is embracing selflessness in their personal lives. Regardless, Belle wants to destroy humanity for polluting the earth and sees a vision of the town destroyed by humanity. She urges the girls to work with her as they've previously defended the town and should want to protect it from catastrophe. It's not an unreasonable motive, but it does feel shallow. Once again, if she was really about it, she would not be attacking random humans. I think there are larger systems at fault. In fact, I'm pretty sure they showed a factory in episode 1, so it's odd that the shadows only seem to attack elders, civilians, and infrastructure. In the real world, it is possible to have a sustainable relationship with the Earth. Placing the blame on individuals is a very sinister message to put in the show. Once again, what did the patients in the hospital do? What did the elders in that apartment complex do? It just seems very bizarre from a writing standpoint. The finale pits Belle against the cures and shows how selflessly they're working to defend the town. This is especially true for Nozomi, whose constant use of the time flower is putting her life at risk. Each of the girls is doing their best for the town and it's a great way to tie in the theme but also raise the stakes for the finale. While initially fighting alone, the town's residents are all encouraged to work together and support the girls. It's an attempt at a collectivist message where individually the humans can't win, but together they can overcome anything. A rebuttal of Bell's argument that humans are selfish by showing how they can work together. Dark Nightlight urges the town folk to take responsibility, and I really enjoyed this because it felt like a practical message for the audience. We might not dismantle the fossil fuel industry, but we can work together to keep our environment clean. The prologue then goes on to show that all the cures are spreading awareness about climate change. But despite that, there will always be selfish people. Otona Precure is a show torn in two halves. There's the slice of life drama following the women and the shadow slash pollution plot. These two are tied loosely by the theme of selfishness. We examine the role it plays in their personal lives and how it stands in the way of humanity's progress. In a way, I respect the show for this message. Despite the neglect of key characters and the bizarre writing, I can respect that the main message was about how selfish people might exist, but together we can work to save the planet. However, I have to fault the shows for how it goes about the two themes. While I praise some of the character work, outside of Nozomi, not a lot of it relates to anything the show is about. Some of the best parts are when the show puts the message aside and focuses on smaller individual stories. Urara's acting career is a real highlight, but it feels out of place in a show about climate change. I also found Rin's commentary on unfair trade a bit jarring. What I believe was attempted here was showing the harsh realities of modern life. Exploitation supports most industries, 
and in a show about climate change, having Rin design jewelry without the ethics of that industry would have been a little tone deaf. It's by far the most overtly political season of Precure. To keep this video streamlined, I've kind of had to ignore a lot of stuff. But that's kind of the problem, isn't it? Otona Precure has a lot going on. Between the eight characters, the fairy boys, climate change and selfishness, I haven't even gotten to Nozomi's wedding. I feel like the show would only thrive given a longer runtime or with a clearer message for the audience. The final speech given before the big attack felt hollow, kind of like what you'd hear on the kids' show. Rather than rallying the masses to work together or pointing out how good humans exist, the cures just give vague platitudes about life. Sure, the crowd cheered them on, but there was no interest in what the future might look like. We saw what a selfish world looked like, but we didn't even imagine the alternative. We might learn a lot about not littering, but what about the massive factories? Did we forget about those? In the show, pollution is presented as a natural consequence of human selfishness, but this isn't actually true. I don't think that most people are working selfishly to pollute the planet. Bell seems to target random humans, but it is telling that outside those developers, we don't see a lot of wealthy or powerful victims. Old ladies are free game, but shadows don't attack an oil rig or something. Pinning the blame of the climate crisis on malicious individuals feels like a very naive message in an otherwise grounded show. All in all, Otona Preacher feels like two separate shows. One is a touching slice of life about coming into womanhood, and the other is a PSA about littering. One of these is a good show, and the other is trash. Every time the shadows appear, it interrupts what could have been a perfectly good episode. Upon rewatch, I found myself zoning out during the shadow scenes because they didn't really add much. At that point, we'd already got the episode's moral hammered in, and I felt like the personal drama was already resolved. The shadows just interrupt whatever was happening, and I'm reminded that this is a show about pollution. The biggest tell about the show's priorities is who gets punished for it and how Belle is written. Toward the finale, we see her regret the shadow's actions as she watches them rampage throughout town. But this is her doing, and based on the framing, we're meant to believe she's hypocritical, engaging in the same destruction she feared. It's a pretty common trope to have radical characters go too far, but I think in this case, it demonstrates how shallow the arguments are. The show ends on a pacified message that individual humans are both the cause and the solution to the climate crisis. And while I'm sure someone believes that, it is far from reality. I can't help but feel that Belle was a pointless addition to an otherwise alright show. So now that we've complained a bunch, I do want to end this with the ending, which is perfectly done and could easily have replaced the OP. We open on the scene of Nozomi crying as she wakes up before the guitar carries us through an album of memories. The nostalgic scene fades and we cut to the cures. I love the Roman numerals in the border and this really pretty shot of milk. I think it's all well paced, especially in the pre-chorus. It builds into one of my favorite sequences where each cure is seen cherishing time itself, represented by different clocks and watches. They all look so happy and it makes me want to cry because they're adults now and that makes me so emotional. I think it's a really effective credit sequence and I wish it was the OP instead. Doki Miki is just not as exciting and features a bunch of footage you'd see in a clip show or commercial. It's not even close to opening material. The song structure is strange too, it's got a slow tempo and kind of slips between verse and chorus. I wish this was at the end of the episode because it did not get me hyped for the show. I actually skipped it every single time that I was rewatching. So now that you're watching the ending of this video, what did you think about Otona Precure? Did it meet your expectations and will you be tuning in next time? I really struggled to get through this again, so I hope they get it together for Mahotsukai. If you enjoy this kind of content, stick around for more soon. I really had fun doing a long form video on a Precure season. I don't usually try those, so if you guys enjoy it, I'd be happy to explore other seasons this way. But if you enjoy this content in general, stick around for more. There's lots of videos on my channel and I will see you guys next time.